Hello friends. Today we are going to discuss about personality. I am Dr. Suresh Bhadadmat, Professor of Psychiatry, working at National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Bangalore. In this video, I will be discussing about personality, how to define and introducing the meaning of personality, various theories which explains how the personality is formed such as biological theories, behavioral theories, psychodynamic, humanistic, triad and well-known five-factor theories will be discussed. And finally, I will be touching upon assessment of personality. Let's understand what is personality. Is it the physical attributes or else is it the psychological attributes? What do you mean by personality? This enigma has been haunting the human being from the antiquity. Let's see how American Psychological Association defines personality. Personality refers to the enduring characteristics and behavior that comprises a person's unique adjustment to life, including the major traits, interests, drives, that is basically motivation, values, self-concept, abilities and emotional patterns. So that means the personality is a very complex definition. There is not a single definition which has been accepted by everybody. In a simple term defined by Encyclopedia of Britannica which defines personality as a characteristics way of thinking, attitude, opinions, feeling, and behavior towards self and others in the society. This is a simple way of defining personality. Now the question is, yes, there is a personality. Every person has their unique personality. Why should we know about this? What is important about this personality? First and the foremost, every person wants to know their strengths and weaknesses. If you know your strengths and weaknesses, you can modify your weaknesses and so that you can become more stronger personality. That means you can use your strengths for your benefit, overcome your weakness. Not only that, suppose you have a personality which career suits for you so that you can decide what which area you need to learn and approach for the job. Similarly, in the corporate sector, they want to suit the job for a particular personality. That means, before recruitment, they would like to choose a personality whether they require an extrovert for a purpose of marketing so that the person is more moving out and able to push the products into the market. That means, before recruitment, the personality assessment can be done or else during the promotion. If you want to have a leader at the top of your maybe organization, if a person has any leadership attributes, again the personality assessment can be done. Suppose for the purpose of wellness of your employees, you may also do personality assessment and if there are weakness, weaknesses in, with regard to their personality, they can be suggested for the modification. Further, the assessment of personality can be done to know whether any person has any uh, personality disorder. Further, it also can be used in the forensic assessment, such as if there is a family discord, marital discord. With regard to antisocial personality disorder, you would like to know recidivism. That means reoffense or recommitting the crime. In all these areas, personality assess become, assessment becomes very important. Not only that, it is an enigma for the human being to know, can we predict the human behavior? Of course, as I mentioned, personality is the enduring characteristics. That means, can we predict reasonably at least how this person is going to behave in the near future? If you look at the market, approximately uh, about 80 million of the employees undergo personality assessment every year. Personality assessment tests are used 
throughout the employee's life cycle. It may be during recruitment, screening, onboarding, training and for the purpose of retention. All sectors apply them, including schools, businesses, hospitals, non-profit organization and even in the military. That means there is a huge market with regard to personality assessment so that the organization can recruit those people with stronger personality who can contribute to their organization. And this personality assessment is a 100 year old market. Unfortunately, it is sprawling, unregulated. Many people are coming with their own instruments which are not been validated and used left right center in the market. The reason being is the revenue in 2019 with regard to personality assessment market was somewhere around $2.3 billion and it has been expected to grow up to $6.5 billion US dollars by 2027. The global market of personality assessment is growing from 10 to 10 to 15 percent annual growth rate is seen. That means there is a huge market and many people would like to tap onto this so that they get their share of revenue. But unfortunately, though the personality assessment is number of instruments are growing, but we do not have a comprehensive, valid, with a good sensitivity and specificity, such a uh, personality assessment tool is not yet been found. Let's look into the history of personality. The available literature, especially from the Western, it has been found to be around three to four centuries back. Similarly, if you look into the Eastern literature, it goes many centuries, dates back to before Christ's birth. If you look into Indian philosophical tradition, such as Vedanta, Yoga, Jainism, Buddhism, and other researchers and scholars in India have attempted to discuss about personality. Although they did not say personality directly, they have, they have used various terms. The concept of personality was introduced very late in the Western literature. But in Eastern literature, they discussed about personality in various terms such as Swabhava, that is in Bhagavad Gita, Purshottham, that was again introduced by Sri Aurobindo, Guna, that means character of a person in Atharvana Veda and other important concept given by Ayurveda was Pravrti, Purusha, Triguna and Traidosha. These are the various concepts which discussed about the personality. Although majority of this Indian literature did not refer the word personality, of course there was no English at the time, especially with regard to Sanskrit, they used in various terms it has been used. But however, the Indian literature talked about the personality from the survival aspect to the spiritual world, that is spiritual person, enlightened person. If you look into Jainism and Buddhism, they discussed about a good person or an enlightened person. If you look at from the Upanishad, this is the various way the personality has been explained how it comes from the inner core to the exterior. So, this attribution has been also been discussed in the Western literature in the recent past. Now, let's look into the theories of personality as described from the Western angle. There are many theories with regard to personality and many researchers have given these theories and most of the theories contributes to the understanding of personality. But not a single theory can explain the personality as a whole. Each theory offers a unique perspective, what makes this personality unique to this individual and various researchers continue to explore personality. They are trying to define personality. Unfortunately, again, there is not a single definition which comprehensively explains personality. Let's look into the various well-known theories. First and the foremost is a biological theory, behavioral theory, psychodynamic theory, humanist, trait and five-factor theories. Let's move into biological theories of personality. 
biological theories of personality emphasizes the role of genetics and other biological factors in shaping the personality. A researcher are using various techniques such as imaging, that may be CT scan, MRI, PET scan and also genetic analysis to understand whether certain personality traits are hereditary in nature. That means they are looking, they are looking into the biological basis of personality. According to this theory, the individual differences in personality may be influenced by factors such as brain structure, neurotransmitters, neurohormones and genetics of course. That means biology plays a very important role as per the people who are working in the area of biological theories of personality. The most well appreciated was Hans Eisensack which argued that Introverts had high cortical arousal, leading them to avoid certain situation which will trigger these anxiety. On the other hand, he believed the extroverts had low cortical arousal, causing them to seek stimulation and experiences from the environment, hence they moved out. This indirectly said that there is something in our body which decides about our personality. Of course, it is a brain structure. It may be neural mechanism, neural circuits, biochemical theories, genetic theories have been proposed. Again, the single biological theory cannot explain the personality as a whole. The main reason being, we can say the twins, especially monozygotic twins, they look similar, may be identical, but however, their personality may not be 100% identical. They may differ in certain aspects. That means even the biological twins which are monozygotic may even differ in their personality. Let's look into the cognitive theories of personality. The cognitive theories of personality focuses on how the people perceive, process and interpret the information about themselves and the world around them. These theories emphasize the role of thoughts, beliefs and attitudes in shaping their personality and behavior. The well-known cognitive theory about personality is by Aaron and Beck's cognitive theory. Here, they discussed, he discussed about cognitive triad, cognitive distortions and cognitive schemas which play a crucial role in, us, in understanding about depression and also about the personality. Further, the George Kelly proposed that people organize their experiences into construct or categorizes that they use to interpret and make sense of the world. This is again one of the well accepted. He believed that personality is shaped by these individual constructs and the way people use them to understand their experiences. So, these are the various cognitive theories which have been proposed. Further, Albert Bandora proposed Social Cognitive Theory Here he proposed that people learn by observation, imitation and reinforcement. He emphasized the importance of self-efficacy or the belief in one's own ability to succeed a task in shaping their behavior and personality. Overall cognitive theories of personality emphasis, emphasis is given to the role of thinking and interpretation in shaping their behavior and personality. Now let's understand behavioral theories of personality. The behavioral perspective is the belief that personality is the result of an individual's interaction with their environment, including the decision they make and action they take based upon the learning principles, such as classical conditioning, operant conditioning and social learning theory. Here the positive consequences, that is reward, increases the likelihood the behavior will repeat many times. Similarly, if there is a negative consequences such as punishment, negative reinforcement decreases the likelihood of the behavior to recur. This theory was proposed by B. F. Skinner. That means, behavioral theory also play a role in understanding of personality. Now let's move into the very controversial understanding about the theory of personality which is psychodynamic theory. Of course, the well-known person is Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud clearly discussed about 
the psychodynamic theory and he, he emphasized the importance of the unconscious mind in shaping the personality. According to this theory, personality is made up of three parts, instinctual drive called as id, ego and the superego. Further, if you look into the Sigmund Freud's work, he talked about topographical theory, structural theory, psychosexual theory and defense mechanism. All these theories was given by Sigmund Freud. Here he discussed how the personality occurs and the development of mental illness. If you look at this diagram, it clearly talks about structural theory and also unconscious mind theory. If you look at the conscious mind, which is easily accessible by the person, pre-conscious is slightly difficult, unconscious is very difficult to access by the person. It requires support by the therapist. Similarly, if you look at the instinctual try, that is id, which is in the most of the thing is in the unconscious mind. Further, ego and superego divides between pre-conscious and unconscious level. Here, the ego is the balance which going to occur or placed by the ego between the id and superego. Instinctual drive is the one which demands for the fulfillment of either hunger, sex or survival. Superego is the society's rules, regulations, morals and ethics. So, superego says no for the instinctual drive. If there is a conflict between the instinctual drive and superego, which will be resolved by the ego, my dear friends. Don't confuse the word ego, which is commonly used in the grammatical sense. Here, the ego is an apparatus which is going to use defense mechanisms to resolve the conflict between superego and instinctual drive. If you, look to, if you look at the Carl Jung's theory, that is analytical psychology, the Jung proposed that people have both a personal unconsciousness which contains repressed memories and experiences and a collective unconsciousness which contains archetypal images and symbols that are shared across culture. Similarly, psychodynamic theories given by Alfred Adler proposed that people are motivated by a desire to overcome the feelings of inferiority and achieve a sense of mastery and self-actualization. He emphasized the importance of social factors such as family, dynamics, cultural influence in shaping the personality. Overall, psychodynamic theories of personality emphasizes the importance of unconscious process, early childhood experiences in shaping the personality and behavior over a period of time, my dear friends. Let's understand the another important uh, the theories that is humanistic theory. Here in this school of theories, the humanistic theory of personality assumes that people are basically good and they strive to reach their full potential. Here the motivation of self-improvement is innate for every animal. That is basically human being. If a person is held back from the goal, that is due to the environment, not because of the internal environment of the human. Human beings are aware and conscious and beings with the capacity of self-awareness is important. Human beings have a free will, can make their own choices and are responsible for their own choices. This is an important component of humanistic theory. Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers played a crucial role in understanding the humanistic theories across the globe. And further, they also proposed each human is unique and the individual must create their own meaning and purpose in life and that they are ultimately responsible for their own actions. People have innate drive towards self-actualization and that they will naturally move towards self-growth and personal development when they are in the environment that is supportive, non-judgmental and empathetic, my dear friends. So if you understand the humanistic theory by Abram Maslow's theory of hierarchy of needs, where the bottom of the pyramid is physiological need regarding hunger and sex, safety is the second, the third one is love and belonging, esteem and finally the self-actualization. That means human 
will try to move towards self-actualization. That is the way humanistic theory is understood. Let's now move into trait theories of personality. Let's understand what is this meaning by trait. Trait can be defined as a habitual pattern of behavior, thoughts and emotion. A trait is relatively be a stable characteristic that causes the individual to behave in certain ways across time and consistent across different situations. The combination and interaction of various traits forms the personality that is unique to each individual or the person. Trait theory is focused on identifying and measuring these individual personal, personality characteristics. So, trait is individually we call it as, whereas the bouquet of traits will confirm that personality. Traits are quantifiable, predictable and measured by various scales and in instruments. The first theory on trait was proposed by Alpert Gordon in 1936. Alpert found that in English languages dictionaries contained approximately 4,000 words which described different personality traits. Those words described in the dictionary is able to place them along the line and said there are 4,000 words which explains personality. He categorized all of these into three segments or organization. One which dominated the trait, he called it as cardinal trait. The central traits which are the revolving around traits which defines to some extent about the personality. The secondary personalities are the personality which put forward by the person telling that I am such a such a person. So that is the secondary traits. As per the Raymond and Kettle, reduce these 4000 traits into manageable 171. Although 171 were there, further he applied statistical analysis and came up with the factor analysis which he came down to 16 personality traits which he was, which he thought he can manage. Similarly, Hans and Isaac developed a model of personality based on three universal traits, that is introversion and extroversion trait, psychoticism and neuroticism. These trait theories further subjected to various analysis, researches, and various researchers came up with five factor theories. That means these 16 theories, that is 16 traits which was put forwarded by the Raymond Kettle was further analyzed, further researched. On factor analysis, they ended up with five factor theory. This five factor theory is considered to be one of the most important theory to understand personality. Let's look into what are these five dimensions which have been looked into. These five dimensions or we can call it as five traits. They are neuroticism, extroversion, openness, agreeableness and consciousness. Let's look into each one of them. If you want to remember all of these five factors, it can be remembered by a mnemonic called as ocean. O means openness, C means consciousness, Extraversion, A means agreeableness and neuroticism. These five theories, these five traits or five factors came by the analysis of Gordon Alpert's and by Raymond Kettle by applying statistical approach that is cluster analysis and factor analysis. Through this factor analysis, they are able to finally boil down to five important factors that is five factor theory. Let's look into openness. What do you this mean by openness? Openness is a spectrum from high openness to low openness. If a person has high openness means he is highly creative, he is open to try new things, focused on tackling new challenges, happy to think about abstract concept. If a person is low in openness, that means he dislikes changes, is rigid, inflexible, does not enjoy new things, resist the change and is not very imaginative and he dislikes abstracts and theoretical concepts. Now let's understand consciousness. 
If a person is high in this, he, sp he spends time in preparing, finishing important tasks right away, pays attention to detail, enjoys having a set of schedule. If a person is low on consciousness, he dislikes the structure and also schedules. He makes a mess, doesn't take things seriously, fails to return things or put them back where they belong. He procrastinates and fails to complete the necessary task assigned to him. Now moving to extraversion. If a person is high on extraversion, he enjoys being a center of attraction, like to give important contribution during the conversation, enjoys meeting, has a wide social circle of friends and acquaintances, finds it easy to make new friends, feels energized when around other people and says things before thinking about them. If a person is low on extraversion means his solitude, that is solitude is alone, feels exhausted whenever he is in a social situation, finds it difficult to start conversation, dislikes making small talk, carefully thinks before he speaks, dislikes being the center of attraction, that is center of attention. Moving to the agreeableness. If a person is high on agreeable means, agreeableness means he has a great deal of interest in other people, cares about others, feels empathy and concerned about other people, enjoys helping and contributing to other people, assist others who are in need of help. The person if he is low on agreeableness means take a, he takes little interest in people, doesn't care about other people, has little interest in other people's problem, insults, belittles others, manipulate others what they want. Finally, the neuroceticism, that is, neuroticism means if a person is high, he experiences a lot of stress, worries about many things, gets, up, gets upset easily, he experiences dramatic shift in moods, feels anxious, edge on the time, struggles to bounce back after the stressful event. If a person is low on neuroceticism means he is emotionally stable, deals well with stress, rarely feels sad or depressed or anxious, does not worry much and is a person is very relaxed. Let's understand what are the critics on this trait theory. The trait theory of personality offers people a way to conceptualize different aspects of personality from the dimensional aspects. This can allow researchers to explore different traits, including how they interact and impact the behavior of a person. The identification of a trait can vary from one researcher to another researcher, from one study to another study. Trait theory also does not explain what causes the individual to behave in certain way, whether this trait and how this trait came into him does not explain under the trait theory. One way, in some situation while behaving, a different way in another situation, the trait theory cannot explain. A person may be highly volatile in the house with the family members, but if you go to his office, he is well behaved, very well respected and also he is very very sensitive to other people in that situation. That means trait theory cannot explain how this person changes so well in a different situation. Now let's understand how to do personality assessment. Before you do any personality assessment, you note you have to know what is the reason you are embarking on the personality assessment. And based upon the reason why you are doing assessment, you need to choose the relevant method of assessment. You can choose self-report assessment or a questionnaire such as MBTI, that is Myers-Briggs type indicators, one of the commonest used nowadays in the corporate sector, Neo Personality Inventory and of course Big 5 Personality Traits questionnaire will be used. That is, these are all self-reporting questionnaire. Invariably, the self-reporting questionnaire has its own merit and demerits. The demerit is, whenever a person asks you about your personality, you will put your best foot forward and many of your traits you may not know at all. That means there will be response bias. That means responder may not tell everything about himself. That is the major drawback of self-report questionnaire. 
The next one is projective tests. These are used to unmask the unconscious impulses, instinctual drive, superego, thinking process is used. That means Rorschach ink blot test and TAT thematic type perception test are used for projective test. Some of them are completely projective and some of them may be semi-projective. There may be sentence completion test. Those are used so that you can uncover what they are thinking. The next one is interview method. Here, a person will engage in a clinical interview, ask about the person, does a 360 degree assessment involving family members, friends, peers and colleagues. So, this is completely unstructured and here again, it is based upon the assessor, that is the clinician's uh, ability, competency on that basis, the report will be given. Finally, the situational judgment test. Here, Agon Development Survey and Occupational Personality Questionnaire is used. In this, certain situations are given to the person. How does he respond and come out of those situations will be rated. On that basis, the personality assessment is done. Further, once you got the assessment report, you need to analyze the results. And once you have analyzed the result, you have to make conclusion and give feedback. And finally, it is your duty to propose the remedial measure to be advised so that he can overcome his weakness. One need to remember, there is no single comprehensive test for personality assessment. That means, combination of personality assessments, methodology should be used. Before you embark on any assessment, you need to understand why you are embarking on this assessment, what is the need of this assessment, what is the purpose of this personality assessment should be known. Based upon the context and purpose, you need to choose the instrument. But however, the comprehensive assessment is combination of all these methods. Next question comes is, next question is whether the single cross-sectional is valid or else multiple longitudinal assessment is better. Of course, multiple assessment based on the longitudinal way is the best way to know than personality. To conclude, my dear friends, there are multiple theories explaining the development of personality and understanding about the personality. There is no single definition about the personality. There are multiple definitions based upon the researchers how they understood personality. Personality assessment is a multi-million, actually multi-billion dollar industry. Hence, many people are coming out up with various instruments which are not validated, which are not, uh, does not have sensitivity and specificity, but they are selling these instruments. You need to be very clear. You need to contact the clinician, psychiatrist or a clinical psychologist to know which is the best instrument to be chosen for your organization and for what purpose you are doing personality assessment in your employees need to be clearly vocalized so that they can suggest the best instrument. Further, as I mentioned, there is no single comprehensive instrument which will give you 360 degree personality assessment. Assessment of personality is based on context and purpose of the assessment should be kept in mind before you embark on personality assessment. Thank you very much for giving your valuable time. Stay safe.